If you do want to ask a question this evening, you can use the raise hand function to uh, to make a point or ask a question. When you do that, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and then I'll unmute you and bring you onto a uh, stage. Questions will be taken at the end of the presentations and I will try to take them in the order where people uh, raise their hands, although we've got quite a lot of attendees this evening, so that might be uh, quite difficult. Um, please mute, put yourself on mute when you're not speaking because that avoids uh, background noise, which we've all come to experience as part of the, the Microsoft Teams world. Uh, and please be aware that members of the media may be in attendance tonight. Uh, we have, we're not aware that anybody from the media is in this evening, but some of the questions or comments that you make may well be covered. So um, that's a bit of housekeeping for you. Just to run very quickly through the agenda, first and foremost, we're going to have a proposal uh, overview presentation that will be led by Councillor Simon Miller and Councillor Paul Douglas alongside Phil Catcherside who's uh, from Hawkins Brown Architects and that will take roughly speaking about 25 minutes and then we've got an hour or so for questions and uh, answers and you can see the list of people there um, that you can ask questions of. So without further ado I'm going to hand over to Councillor Simon Miller who's going to get us underway for this evening. Simon over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Ollie, and thank you to everyone for making the time to join us this evening. So our starting point for the proposal that we're here to talk about is the need to make better service provision in North Chingford, to invest in the North Chingford area, particularly to provide new community infrastructure, which we know is lacking, and that could include also a GP surgery. But we know the need for that investment, the need for that infrastructure, particularly that space for the community to be able to come together and for services to be provided from is that much greater as a consequence of COVID. One of the key things that we want to enable through the investment and through the proposal that we're here to present today is adult learning service provision in this new hub. That will enable people to access skills training, employment training and work. So the proposal is part of the council's infrastructure delivery plan. That's the framework that sets out what is required in terms of infrastructure in Waltham Forest. So that's everything from schools through GP surgeries to community centres to youth provision, not just for Waltham Forest, but also for the North Chingford area as well. What we want to do, what we want to create is a 21st century library that meets the community's lead, needs. And my colleague Paul will talk about what that actually means uh, shortly. In addition to that, we want to create integrated, multiple use, flexible space that will effectively re-provide the assembly hall, but to do this as a single cohesive hub. All of this will be paid for and enabled through housing development. We also want to create an active civic presence on Chingford Green to get more people using that space. We want to create an anchor for Station Road that will draw footfall from the top end of Station Road around the station down towards the green to help bring new business to that part of North Chingford. We want to create a new landscape connection to the green, as well as resolve some of the linkages to Mornington Road, which we know have created problems and issues for residents for some time. And we're determined that we'll do this with a design that preserves and enhances the conservation area and the green. So we are talking about design of the highest quality that will fit with the area. I want to stress that we are at the very earliest stages of development. So this is the feasibility stage, the design, how it fits with a wider conservation area and conservation policy will be subject to community input as also the planning process. And all of this will require detailed planning permission through the planning committee process. At this point, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Paul, Thanks, Simon. Um, yes, so as it says there, the, the new library will be a Library Plus offer. <clears throat> there will be uh, enhanced adults and children's uh, library provision, the ICT suite and digital services, uh, hopefully a cafe, uh, a council services other than what are normally provided in a library. Uh, Citizens Advice Bureau would be an option um, and defined zones. As well as that, there would be additional flexible spaces for groups in the community uh, to use for meetings, uh, classes, events, etc. 
the larger ICT area would not only increase provision for studying, working, personal use, but would also allow for better classes uh, for those who need help with the use of technology. We would actually, um, a bigger library would mean that we could have a bigger collection of books and there would be more space for people to read and enjoy the new library, creating a more welcoming feel. Um, as those photos show the new Wood Street Library, I would encourage all of you that haven't already been to go to the new Wood Street Library to see what a modern fit for purpose 21st century library could look like. Uh, next slide, please. So there are many limitations on the current library. Uh, the, the, the assembly hall and the library are separate buildings with their own entrances, uh, toilets and other facilities. They've got poor thermal properties. The library's interior is inflexible, increasing the inflexibility, uh, increasing the, the flexibility of the library's internal space uh, within the existing building would be challenging. Multiple design issues, neither building has a lift and the assembly hall is underutilized. As well as that, um, it's almost a victim of its own success. Chingford Library's current events are very well attended and there's actually not sufficient space to expand and diversify the events scheduled for like all of the communities that the library serves. The footfall in the library has basically outgrown the space available, limiting opportunities to grow the book collection or any of the other services. And there are very limited bathroom facilities for a busy library. Um, and that's me. Thank you. Finished. Thank you very, very much. We're now going to hand over to Phil Catchside, who's a partner at Hawkins Brown Architects, who's going to take you through the proposal. Oh, apologies, you're not. Oh. You're slightly too early. Ago. I'm coming back, coming back to yourself, Councillor Miller. My apologies. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Paul out what the Library Plus offer looks like, and at the very heart of this proposal is the determination to to bring about a best-in-class library for Chingford and for the people of Chingford. Underpinning that, we want to create spaces for people of all ages, so it is usable by the old and the young, and all those in between. We want to bring about the cafe as well, because we know that cafes encourage library uses, and where you have good choice of cafes, you increase footfall in the local area as well. That is the story of all of our most successful high streets. We want meeting rooms, so we can provide a community offer, and we want learning space, particularly for the letter adult learning service so people can access employment support at this difficult time and we also want to create a GP surgery in the complex as well but it isn't just about community service provision we want to ensure that Chingford has really good assembly space so we want to create a cultural asset for the area that has multiple flexible uses uh, and effectively provides the type of provision that could be provided by the assembly hall if it weren't so inflexible that includes petitions to facilitate large and small events, a 3.5 plus meter ceiling to enable for large assemblies uh, and festival type events, bookable space for adult learning and for others. And as I said right at the top of this, we know that there isn't budget in existing council uh, funds to provide this, so this can only be paid for, that all council development can broadly only be paid for through enabling residential development. And we see this as needing potentially 40 homes to enable this development. Next slide, please, Ben. So in terms of engagement, I've said we're at the very early feasibility stage and we will need to consult at multiple points uh, throughout this project. We've set up a community engagement and user group made up of local community groups to feed into our thinking. We've also set up a local members reference panel, so local councillors also have opportunity to feed in their thinking. Uh, we're doing some work at the moment to understand how we can best engage with older residents, and that includes working with age concern. Obviously, current COVID restrictions make that difficult, but that's why we're slightly slow to the field with this, because more thinking needs to be done to ensure that whatever we bring forward, it conforms with COVID rules uh, and is also COVID secure. This is the first of two public information meetings. The second will be just before the start of the formal planning process. So in terms of timelines, there will be a report that will go to the Council's Cabinet for approval in January, confirming the final scope of the project, the detailed design, and whether the Council chooses at that point to go ahead with a viable scheme. 
There will be an additional public information event in February next year, uh, as well as further consultation events as part of the planning application process in the spring of next year as well. And that's when there'll be really detailed opportunity for the community to comment on the detail of the design. Um, there's also opportunity for the community engagement and user group to be involved in the co-design of the fit out of the new library, and what it looks like inside, what it feels like inside, as well as the multi-use assembly spaces. So some key dates there for you. We will be engaging. This is at the very earliest stage and there is plenty of opportunity to involve yourselves and to involve community groups in this process. Ollie, back to you. Thank you, Councillor Midder. And uh, for the second time, we're gonna hand over to Phil Catcherside from Hawkins Brown. So Phil, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Apologies, there are some fireworks going off, so you may hear some bangs. Um, um, we would like to just uh, make the point that we have been asked to look at uh, initial uh, architectural studies, feasibility studies, uh, taking uh, the development brief, uh, essentially, which was um, um, uh, put put to the cabinet in June, and um, is here the re redevelopment of the Chingford Library and Assembly Hall opportunity to deliver a new modernised cultural asset for Chingford, uh, Chingford providing a significant investment and an important civic presence around the green. So we are essentially taking on uh, a, a brief given to us and we are exploring how that um, how that might um, develop as a design um, in early stages to reiterate. Next slide please. So just a, a little bit of the structure of our presentation, we introduce ourselves uh, and other um, consultants involved in the early assessment. Uh, we go back to look at the timeline of our design process, uh, the brief, we refresh on that, and, the, and we start to um, show you our initial uh, context analysis and thoughts about how we would approach a design for Library Plus and um, uh, other community facilities and of course the housing which is is essentially providing the um, uh, the funding for uh, those um, other buildings um, and we start to indicate how we are thinking about laying out the site itself uh, and um, um, the word here that we, we will be showing diagrams essentially there, there won't be finalized designs to be shown at this first session next slide please um, so we, I represent here Hawkins Brown Architects and we are um, um, award-winning practice. We work across many sectors. Uh, we're working in, in the borough on, on multiple projects. We also have um, experience designing Library Plus buildings and uh, other community uh, facilities and buildings um, in a mixed-use environment and often in hybrid uh, buildings with, with accommodation uh, flats, etc. Um, included. And on this page, we are um, just showing a couple of these libraries, bottom left and centre. Uh, this is our recently completed Plumstead uh, Library, uh, completely remodelled. Um, and on the right, we're showing top two images, the rec uh, recently um, approved um, Roehampton Library as part of the Alton State Redevelopment in Wandsworth. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, we also on the team have uh, built heritage consultancy to uh, help assist the team uh, in terms of uh, the heritage um, side of things and the, the sensitivities uh, to help guide the design and um, um, to um, augment our own architectural um, um, approach. Uh, so there are two consultants uh, dealing with assessing uh, the architectural and the um, urban um, and listed in conservation area in terms of how that will inform the design. Next slide, please. Um, so really, we before we put pen to paper, we start to think about how our design approach, how we might formulate a design approach and what, what our priorities are or, or what how we order our thinking. And, um, and this this really touches on a few of those. We want to maximise the opportunity to provide the new library and assembly space and other community facilities. Uh, we want to develop a high quality design uh, in in that process. We want to provide active and accessible frontage to the green, 
as a key civic frontage and key interaction with uh, the public provide new public space and routes on and through the site and at the moment um, which might not be available at the moment and to enhance connectivity and permeability um, with any new building and uh, public space around those buildings any new building uh, is as important as the building itself often uh, we want to enhance the setting of the existing heritage assets as much as we can in the surrounding area and the design and materials are to be informed by contextual analysis and, and, and echoing earlier um, words taken from the development is, that is part of our brief to make sure that we are sensitive um, for the site area. Uh, we want to have a sustainable building with low energy use and embodied energy if we can, uh, maintain and enhance the use and setting of the pocket park, uh, maintain and enhance and making places landscape connection. Um, and um, I can't see it now because some of these uh, covered over. So my list has gone. Thank you. Uh, have a sympathetic approach to the conservation area, especially in relation to Carver's Cottage, but also other uh, uh, buildings and uh, in the area. Uh, and that's uh, quite a theme. I'm going to cover that. The mural, the Millennium Mural, we would like to find a way of engaging and retaining that and uh, having that in our new design. So, uh, but also fundamentally here, we have new affordable homes uh, to be provided in a sympathetic and appropriate relationship to the surroundings, uh, hopefully enhancing the area. And uh, next slide, please. So those are the things we'd like to do in our, in our design um, process. This is the timeline again, and we're, we're really in the early stages here. We're in the feasibility design work, so this is the first stage. Um, and we are in the initial public engagement uh, event, the cabinet meeting in January next year, and um, all things being um, approved, uh, a, a possible planning submission in uh, uh, early summer next year. So that's the timeline. Next slide, please. Um, we're very, very conscious, obviously, of the existing conservation area and, and those heritage assets within it, principally, also, uh, of course, the green itself, but uh, buildings within the area designated. And that's forming part. We have um, reviewed the area and we rely also on our other consultant um, colleagues uh, in the built heritage consultancy to give us extra uh, detail on those those buildings. Next slide, please. There's a bit of a delay on the slide change, I think. It's yeah, Phil, I don't think your, your, your internet connection is terrific. Uh, so I suggest you turn off your video. OK. Um, so our, one of our first ports of call for um, understanding an area is looking at the use and how buildings and other, other public spaces are used around them. So here's our um, um, mapping essentially of, of residential commercial and retail uses and community uses around the area gives us a, a, an idea of what's going on in adjacent areas site in the center ring then uh, outlined in red next slide please um, but also uh, a, a historical understanding or an understanding of the historical development of the site so here we found um, this was Contrary to what we had initially thought, uh, that it seemed that the site itself that the current buildings sit on had retained a sort of single ownership and a, and a different pattern of development than the um, um, residential streets around it. And, and in fact, the uh, station road also. So this was quite an unusual site in itself in terms of its development. Next slide, please. And uh, this is an aerial showing the existing buildings uh, in the context with the green to the left. Um, and showing actually here that the, the, the existing building is actually um, a, um, a different sort of um, footprint scale than uh, a lot of the surrounding buildings and pattern of development. Next slide, please. Um, and for our design 
process and part of our analysis um, is is finding and using three-dimensional information. So this, these are some snapshots of a three-dimensional model that we have in order to help us understand uh, the designs that we might be developing. Uh, and that's very useful in terms of uh, generating views, et cetera, uh, from street level and other places. Um, and uh, we'll be showing you some more slides of that later. It should be said that these aren't surveys, so these are uh, fairly accurate representations of the three-dimensional um, environment, but these are um, not surveys at the moment, but it's very helpful at this stage to understand the, um, how the building currently sits and how our proposals might sit in the context. Next slide, please. Um, so we, as part of our development brief that we have been given is the, um, uh, the rough number of units, uh, circa 40 that um, the appraisals which have been done before would suggest could provide those facilities that form the non-residential part of this brief. Uh, and also the development brief indicates that something up to six stories might uh, would it should be explored. Uh, and clearly where we're dealing with a sensitive site area and sensitive buildings adjacent and settings from the green, etc. The first thought here as most people would be aware is is how um, um, buildings of that number of flats and the accommodation schedules that come with the community facilities can be accommodated sympathetically on, on the site. Uh, and with the idea that it might be uh, a reasonably significant height in, in relation to the surrounding buildings, where would an appropriate mass, where would a what massing strategy would be useful in um, in um, reducing the impact of any of that um, higher massing on any proposal? And so here is a diagram looking at where we think some of those areas uh, on the existing site uh, might be less sensitive, and where we might put more of the massing of the building uh, in order to do. Uh, two things. One is to respect the uh, setting of the green and the buildings around it, but also to provide obviously the uh, accommodation that's required in the brief. Next slide, please. So our general approach to massing here is to mitigate the impact of the development on Cobbis Cottage and the conservation area generally, and that includes all the buildings and settings. Um, we keep height down where we can, uh, up to six stories following appraisal of context. Um, and that means uh, in order to do that, we want to maximize the number of units, and this in this case meaning residential units per floor to achieve a, a low massing objective. So the more units we can get the single floor, the lower the building overall might need to be. Uh, we would, we're proposing here that providing a single hybrid building to maximize the usable uh, site area for the building would be the most efficient use of the land, but also produce the most compact and therefore uh, less um, imposing building uh, and that general strategy has served as well on other similar types of projects. I uh, would also like to use utilize existing massing and footprint of the existing building as much as possible and in com uh, um, in straightforward way saying that actually if there's a building and a footprint there already we should be looking at ways of uh, working within that as much as possible uh, certainly on the footprint so that the impact is um, reduced. Uh, and create new public pedestrian connection through from Mornington Road to the new to Station Road, and and as I said earlier, really trying to knit in and open up new um, connections um, and pleasant uh, public realm that um, can be adding not just the building but um, adding to the public realm um, environment in this in on the site, and reinforce the pattern of the gardens uh, located nearby by pulling away massing from the northwest corner so that we our analysis of the development was that actually although this site never seemed to form part of that original um, uh, residential development pattern the, the there's a clear um, area where a greenery and ex ex people's gardens and existing greenery uh, could be completed and would be a useful uh, addition to that uh, green space. Next slide, please. 
Um, so here we come to our organizational diagram, um, essentially a first thoughts as to how the ground floor in particular might be organized and the, and the main functions that are contained within the brief might be organized on the site. Um, and so here we can see uh, on the right hand side within the red line, the key connection that we want to make between Station Road and the Green and um, Wilton Road to the north. And this is essentially a pedestrian connection, possibly cycle as well, uh, but it isn't a continuation of the road um, because uh, it would be, it doesn't seem appropriate to bring traffic, et cetera, uh, along that route. Now, to the left of that um, are the uh, main functions of the building. Now, the key, one of the key uh, um, aspirations here is to create as much fr uh, active frontage i.e. Um, windows with views in and out um, to help activate the public realm, but also to give um, enjoyable views into the activities within the building and, and vice versa. Uh, to the, to the uh, green, so which is the main civic frontage, but also along the uh, new connection, we're calling it library walk at the moment, north-south, uh, and to make a secure and, and safe place uh, for all these public space areas around the building. Um, so to that end, we, we have thought about the brief that was contained within the Library Plus uh, in more detail and are suggesting that the main library really should have the main and largest connection in terms of frontage to the green. You can see the largest uh, yellowy orange uh, bubble there. Um, um, in that location on the cafe on the corner where we've got the uh, new library walk going north south we think that's a good place to have uh, a cafe which is contained within the brief because that captures people passing by it's a, it's a social space and it brings people into the library and brings people in on um, an informal basis uh, especially uh, people with children who might be visiting the library uh, who might be um, using the children's library but also a soft play play date sort of social and active environment on the ground floor interacting with the public spaces outside and the soft play in fact in our uh, plumstead library we do have a soft play there and a cafe that's a very useful uh, social uh, gathering space uh, which leads into other functions of the library also on the ground floor here we have the multifunctional space which is pretty much what it says that, that we uh, there was a great deal of uh, additional functions within the library plus which uh, uh, can be flexibly used and, and changed through time as the requirements of, of the public essentially uh, changes um, and then we see the library call which uh, would take um, people up to the a first and this is where we are proposing that actually a first floor library accommodation is a very useful way to have a a quieter um, space for the library and possibly for uh, reading um, in a quieter area, but also for events and, and spaces that could be separated off from the main library function um, or when events are on. It, but it also gives a, a sort of gallery overlooking Ching, uh, the green, which uh, uh, and views actually to the public and, uh, and community and residents, which isn't necessarily available at the moment. So a sort of reflective space where you are at one story above, looking back out uh, across into the trees and onto Station Road and seeing essentially the uh, business, uh, people going about their business from a different perspective. So that's quite a useful way that a public building can offer those views and that interaction with those public spaces in a different way than um, if it's only on the ground floor. To the north, we are saying essentially the site we see the Library Plus building being to the south with the main frontage across over the green. To the north at the end of the Monitor Road, which is a residential street. Um, the residential core and the residential um, element of the building, the character, the residential character of the building is is on the north side and the library character of the building is on the south side. So that fundamental division north south means that we can group other um, activities at ground floor we're suggesting actually that there might be some houses continuing Mornington Road and that's to do with a, a transition of scale that's that's helpful but also a transition between 
um, the public realm and the new library walk, uh, turning circles and practical things like that. And on the corner, in as much as we've got the library and the cafe and the uh, public functions on the south side, the GP surgery and the entrance to that north side corner, so it's northeast essentially, is is a good way to activate and uh, give a, an identity to a GP surgery, which would be part of this hybrid building, uh, but a, a good way also to um, give active frontage and um, um, purpose to the library walk and, and the end of Mornington Road. And um, you can see the green space, the completing the green space of the uh, the, the row of gardens behind. Um, the idea that, that there there would be a good place, obviously, to put um, a green space that would be part of this proposal. So really, this is our first thoughts about how the site might be um, approached from, uh, and and this is taking our brief um, and arranging it on the site in a way that makes the most use and the most um uh, interactivity between the ground floor public realm and the functions behind next slide please um and i mentioned before that this is another three-dimensional um, model we have that helps us to understand uh, the scale and the um, um character of the um, buildings around the site itself uh, Again, this isn't surveyed information, but this is quite is as accurate as we can get for this stage of um, studies. And along the bottom here, you can see a section that we've essentially um, composed from uh, the various three dimensional information that we have. And what this shows are the fairly significant buildings in the area um, in comparison to um, what would be a six story, um, six residential story building. And you can see, hopefully, perhaps. It's a little bit small, but there's a red arrow pointing to a, a datum there, which uh, runs left to right across the uh, section there. And you can see uh, the spire of St. Peter and Paul. Uh, you can see the existing library underneath the red um, arrow. And then buildings along the high street with um, uh, ridge heights and, uh, and chimney heights, etc. And the, the Pretzel building, as we call it, on the far left. So really that's establishing well, it's, it's showing you our understanding of the scale and the heights and, and this is uh, informing our design. Uh, and we're not proposing, we're not showing you a building here yet. We're just showing you what the six stories looks like because we wanted to find out obviously ourselves. Next slide please. So the the overall vi vision really is to uh, provide a new library with multi-use assembly and community space, which we can use flexibly. Uh, the cafe is a very important part of most public buildings, actually, but especially uh, in our experience, library is very useful for bringing informal um, passers by in and out and gives life to a building. Um, which uh, people can interact with the library. Uh, without having um, necessarily the need to get uh, to be there, they can find the library activities and other activities within it in a more casual way. Uh, and that can include adult learning and, and older residents offer that so that people can um, find their way into other activities and other um, things going on in this combined building. The GP surgery also co-located here brings people to uh, um, engage with other facilities within this building uh, and the enabling residential development uh, including the 50 percent affordable housing for local people means that this building is is a a building with many activities all happening in in a single on a single site so next slide please Thanks, Phil. I think uh, that's that brings us to the end of the presentation. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. I can see that there's chat going on uh, and, and the such like, and we've got some hands up and I'm going to take the hands in the order that, that I've noted them down in. Can I just ask um, of the project team? I'm, I'm not worried about who answers this particularly, but can we just make sure that the presentation is uploaded to 
um, the website alongside the video. And just for everybody's information, the website is wolfhamforest.gov.uk slash content slash regeneration dash chingford dash hub. Somebody will put that in the chat for you. And uh, the email, if you don't get your question asked tonight, you can email chingfordhub at wolfhamforest.gov.uk. So I am going to ask first and foremost a question that has appeared in the chat, but we also got one in uh, prior to the meeting. Um, and this might be one for yourself, Phil, or potentially for Joe. Um, what arrangements are being made to provide parking facilities for the new residents of this development? There is already great pressure on parking in Mornington Road and surrounding roads. So, um, Joe, perhaps you want to answer that uh, or, or yourself, Phil. So in, in line with the local plan and the emerging local plan, it will be predominantly a car free development. However, in, in line with plan policies, there will be blue badge uh, parking spaces for disabled residents in the new development. Uh, in, in terms of mitigating the traffic impact um, for the scheme to obtain planning permission from the local planning authority, there'll need to be a full um, traffic impact assessment produced, which will um, talk about how the how the site is accessed, um, provision for uh, bike storage, etc., um, to, to to move away from a car reliant development to, to being a car free development. Thanks, Joe. OK, I'm going to start to bring people uh, in uh, to ask some questions. Can I just ask you to be as concise as possible? Um, we've got currently 14 hands up and I suspect more will go up over the course of the evening. So if I could just ask you to ask your question as quickly as possible and then I will bring you back in for another round of questionings if we another round of questions if we manage to get through uh, everybody this evening. But we've got about 50 minutes to to go, so we should get through quite a good deal here so the first the first person who had their hand up was lucy uh, lucy i'm just going to unmute you now so i've allowed you to unmute you just have to unmute yourself and then you can ask your question lucy are you there okay lucy i don't think you are so we will go to uh, irena vale lucy if you do come back i will i will find you so um Irina Vale, I'm going to allow you to unmute. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. The question is actually from my husband, David, so he's going to ask it now. OK, um, will the green be fully available for use during the works or will it be blocked off with builders, huts? And also you mentioned the GP suite. Um, we're, we're lacking an NHS dentist in North Chingford, as far as I'm concerned. They seem to all be private. Could that be? associated in the build. Joe, do you want to take that one? So in, in, in terms of the green, uh, the, the council doesn't own the green, it belongs to the City of London Corporation and all of the construction, uh, including the contractors, compounds, all their storage facilities will need to be within the council's red line of the existing site. So the green will remain as is throughout the uh, construction process. In terms of a GP surgery, that's a, a really interesting suggestion. We, we, we can take that back uh, to uh, NHS England who commission dental services and, and see if they feel there's a demand for a, a dental surgery in the area. Ollie, can I, can I quickly come in on that? Of course, please do, Simon, yes. Yeah, so I mean, the suggestion of a dental surgery is absolutely excellent. And this is the purpose of these meetings is to get ideas and input from the community so what we come up with is the best possible scheme um, obviously as joe's alluded to during construction we want to minimize the impact on residents we want to minimize the impact on chingford town center so we'll be doing everything we can to be the best possible considerate constructors um, uh, and that means not taking space from the green which will remain fully available to residents throughout Thank you very much. OK, the next question, uh, Simon Tuhig, I'm going to bring uh, yourself in. Uh, I'm just going to allow you to unmute. Uh, and now you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Do we have you, Simon? I sense that was a noise, but maybe not. OK, uh, we'll move on swiftly then. Uh, Yvonne Sanders, you're, you're next up, so I'm going to allow you to unmute. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question. Thank you. 
Um, we were originally told in a previous discussion as part of the Community Hub Forum that there would be a double height space. 3.5 metres is way short of that. What is the height of the existing assembly hall building, please? Is that one for yourself, Joe, or one for Phil? Maybe yourself, Joe. Um, I so I, I we'll, we'll take that comment away, and we'll uh, we'll get a measure of the existing um, assembly hall space and compare what's proposed with that. Thank you. The reason for the question is that currently the space, well, historically as well as currently, the space has been used for ballet shows, gang shows, um, um, uh, all, all sorts of other types of shows by CADOS, the local amateur dramatic society, and 3.5 metres would be woefully inadequate to set up any kind of stage for performances. So it really needs to be substantially higher than that to be a truly multifunctional space for that kind of event and, and including for weddings. 3.5 metres as a ceiling height for weddings, etc., is, is not sufficient. And where in the plans is there any mention of a commercial kitchen and bar to enable catering for weddings? Thanks, Yvonne. Um, Joe. Really useful feedback, Yvonne, and we'll, we'll, we'll feed that into um, the, the ideas the architects are working on. Thank you very much. OK, I'm going to uh, um, allow uh, Catherine Shaw, I'm just going to allow you to unmute. So um, if you just unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Are you there? Oh, we're not having a very good success rate with this at the moment. OK, um, it's Councillor Halibi, I think, who I'm going to bring in now. Um, hopefully you'll. Uh... Yes, good evening. Thank good you. evening. Um, I've got two questions I'd like to put forward. Um, one is um, the existing assembly hall. A uh, number of times we've been told that um, it's underutilized, partly because uh, its cost has been creeping up and very expensive for community groups to be able to use it. And I'm just wondering, uh, going, going on what the council has done on a number of occasions is what guarantees will they give residents that uh, any new development, that this won't be the case, this is the first question. And the second question is what value has the council put on this land that will be sold to 60 bricks? Now, we understand that 60 bricks is uh, council owned, but there has to be a monetary transfer. I've been asking this question many times. There is a reason for it, and I still haven't had the answer. I wonder if somebody could please let us know at the earliest possible time what value the council is placing on the land. To be Thank, you very much. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Councillor. Um, Joe, I'll hand over to you in the first instance. Maybe Councillor Millie, you might want to come in. Yeah, well, should we, should we, should we should I take the first question? Yeah, please, yeah, please. Go for the more technical answer in, in relation to the second. So, I mean, one of the reasons, we, we need a building that covers its costs. Right. Um, one of the reasons why the assembly hall is underused is because it's desperately expensive to run. It's also very, very inflexible. That restricts how it can be used, and it basically means it has to be charged at a certain rate to cover those costs as much as possible. What we're proposing is really flexible space that can be used appropriately, so can be by small groups, by large groups, for weddings, for the sort of dramatic purposes that Elaine was talking about earlier. That's what we want to see. What we don't want is a building that just sits there and isn't used and gradually falls apart because we can't afford the upkeep as a council because our budgets have been cut and yet residents can't afford to use it. And that is the worst possible outcome. So we're talking about highly flexible space that can be used in a range of different, for a range of different uses uh, that will be charged appropriately so the community can use it because that's what we want to do this. We want a cultural asset that can be used and enjoyed by the community but reflecting the reality of council finances and where we are at the moment as a country, 
one that people can afford to use and one that covers its costs. Over to you, Joe. So in, in, in terms of the land value, the council will retain the freehold of the site and it will own the library and, and, and the hub so that, that that building will return to the council, will be in the council's ownership, operated by the council uh, once the development project has completed. So in terms of um, looking at the land value, it's, it's a matter of weighing up the site's existing use value and the value of the returned assets the council are getting back through the transaction with 60 bricks. All of this will be subject to um, approval by the council shareholder for committee for 60 bricks by the council's cabinet and by 60 bricks board and will all be done in a transparent way but the only the only way we can deliver the new hub facility is to do an enabling housing development and that's that's what's generating the value from the site that that will enable us to deliver the new hub itself okay thanks joe um I, i'm going to take a question from Catherine shaw who, who i did try to bring on but wasn't quite able to um wasn't quite able to work out how to unmute. So she says, my question is, how can you mitigate the negative impacts of the cafe and the new development um, uh, on existing cafes? Uh, is it possible to form links with to existing cafe, cafes, e.g. for catering events, rather than doing them out of business? Maybe um, that's one for Councillor Miller, potentially. Yeah, so I think the answer, what we don't want to do is, is put local businesses out of business. We know these are really difficult, tough and challenging times. Lockdown that's just started is only going to make that worse. This is about how we can invest in Chingford High Street, how we can invest in Station Road, uh, how we can help local businesses. And by bringing footfall, bringing more reason for people to visit, more reason for people to use, we think that will be a boon to all of the wider businesses. But on a specific point about building links, of course we're open to that as an idea. Absolutely. We want to work with local businesses to help them so they get through the current crisis. And when this is built, they thrive in a redeveloped town centre, at the heart of which will be a spanking great new library that serves its community and serves its residents as well as possible. Thank you. And I, I, I see that there's lots going on in the chat as well. So uh, I'm sure a member of the team will be capturing all of that, that feedback as well. But I'm going to go back to um, the hands up. So I've got Beth Murray. I think Beth Murray might be joined by a, a couple of people. So um, I'm going to allow, I'm going to press allow to unmute and then you unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. Hi, thank you Hi. very much. I'm uh, representing the Keep Chingford Green campaign, which is the community campaign around this development. So representing myself um, and my family, of course, but also representing the voices of over a thousand people who are engaged in, in this development. I have a couple of questions. My first one jumps um, on from Cathy's really, and it's directed towards um, Mr. Miller. The question is about the economic regeneration of the high street. So I've spent, you've, you've said, in several places the initiative is to kickstart economic regeneration well I've spent a lot of time this week talking to shopkeepers and cafe owners along the green who are frankly furious about the proposal to put a cafe in place and in fact are putting together a joint letter accusing the council of anti-competitive practices they're they're concerned that you are not only putting in place a uh, competitor to their businesses, both cafes and soft plays. They're concerned that you are restricting flow to their businesses by taking the library, which does have 12,000 people a month visit it, out of action for uh, at a point when they would be looking to rebuild their businesses. And they're concerned that the green is going to be overtaken permanently by residents of this building who will have no, no uh, personal, build, uh, personal gardens of their own. So my specific questions are, how is this going to kickstart economic regeneration? And specifically, how are you measuring economic regeneration? And I have a second question, which is targeted to, to Hawkins Brown. The buildings that Beth, you were- Beth, uh, Beth, could you, yeah, I'm happy for you to ask it, but it has to be course. concise, because we've got a few more people to come in, so I please know, be I've, concise. I've, yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate that. So the buildings you're referring to as um, as buildings, comparison sizes, so the Bull and Crown and the Spire of St. Peter's, they are acceptable in the area because they are beautiful listed heritage buildings. Is the intention to make this a beautiful, traditional, listed looking heritage building? Thanks for that, Beth. Um, Councillor Miller, I'll bring you in first and then Phil, um, you can follow up. So Councillor Miller. 
So, so the intention is to bring forward a building that is excellent in design terms, that works for the area and is an asset to the area. Now, all the work that we have done in terms of regeneration, looking at how you enable out of town or suburban town centres to thrive, particularly where their transport links are not good, suggests that you need to create a deeply experiential high street. We are absolutely clear as a council that a cafe in this part of the green would act as a spur to greater economic activity and a draw. That is the experience of other town centres. Uh, we're of course going to talk to local business owners about the proposals as we go on, uh, but we think that's very much the way forward. Um, in terms of regeneration, this will create jobs. This will create jobs during construction. It will create jobs once it is built, uh, particularly given there will be GP surgery and other. Uh, there will be training opportunities and supply chain opportunities. As a council, this is the single greatest investment that we can make in the area using the one site that we have available to do so. Um, personally, I think the green should be used by families. And I think the idea of the green being overrun is, is somewhat unpleasant concept. I would rather see it well used by families throughout the year. Uh, and I would welcome that as a development. Thanks, Councillor Miller. And, and Phil, do you just want to come in briefly and, and just talk about the heights and the, and the question that Beth posed about the design of the building as well? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think we uh, our first step really is to look to look at the, the buildings that, that you mentioned. And, and in terms of their height, they are some of the tallest buildings in, in the area. And that's why it's, it's useful for us to understand uh, the the height and mass in context that we're working in. I, I don't think we're suggesting that they're similar building types. I mean, this will be fundamentally um, a community building, so in some respects similar to other community buildings like churches. But the the Bull and Crown and or the Brezzo, as we call it now um, for shorthand, um, are are different. They perform different functions. So I don't. Uh, we we would. Uh, not automatically assume that we they give us um, um, the inspiration for what this building would be. I think we would. Uh, the second part of that question, I think, uh, was to do with sort of beauty uh, and architectural expression. I suppose uh, certainly we would always want to make beautiful buildings, and obviously beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I think we we wouldn't necessarily be looking to make it look like a traditional building. So we wouldn't we would want the building of its time and of its place. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are ignoring the context. Um, um, and there are many ways that um, modern buildings and contemporary buildings now are beautiful in ways that don't necessarily reference past architectural styles. So I think that I, I'm. That's how I understand your question. I think the 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 ability uh, to be contemporary but not necessarily alien is what we're we would like to be achieving here um, because as the the, the whole of um, the context of the green has been assembled over many years, decades, centuries, and each contributor to that sort of assembly of uh, buildings and spaces has happened during a particular period and they have brought those influences from that period and expressed it in their own buildings of time of their own time and of their own place so i think that's what we'd be wanting to try and do and certainly yes beautiful we would uh, very much want it to be beautiful um uh, hopefully that okay thanks phil yeah that, that's that's fine um uh, alan in the chat said i would like to ask a question but i don't have a a raise hand icon. Alan, if that's the case, put your pop your question into the chat and we will uh, we will ask that for you. Um, the next person I'm going to bring on is Felix. Felix, um, just going to allow you to unmute. You should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question, Felix. Hopefully you uh, are managing that, Felix. If you're not, maybe put your question into the chat. Uh, I'm not hopeful. OK, uh, we'll move on quickly then to uh, Thea North. So just going to allow you to unmute. You just have to unmute yourself and you should be able to ask a question. Phil, could you just go on mute, please?
Ah, we got another problem with the uh, with the unmuting going on here. That's a couple in a row. OK, I'm going to go third time lucky. Ray Gibbs, I'm going to allow uh, you to unmute now. Hopefully. Ray, can you hear us? OK, I'm slightly worried that there's a, a bit of an issue here, so I'm going to revert to uh, the meeting chat so everybody get your questions into uh, the meeting chat for the time being and we will see uh, where we get to in terms of microphones and the such like uh, I've got a question here which is from uh, Neville which is um, I don't have a microphone this looks an interesting concept I would have thought that anything that brings footfall and business to North Chingford is positive if this building goes ahead does that mean that all of Station Road could be redeveloped to the same height um, I think it's a bit out of scope, but if if somebody wants to very briefly say something about that, potentially, does this set a precedent for Station Road, Joe? I mean, that is that is slightly out of scope in terms of um, this this project, but it um, it it will be a high quality development on Station Road. But as Councillor Miller said, this is one of the few. Um, significant development sites on on station road so it's about delivering a really high quality de design that's fitting for its setting okay thank you very very much um we're just going to go in again to is the pro forma information available for public viewing asked paul yes it will be um the presentation and this will um uh be uploaded uh, quickly after this um Let's have another question from there, from here, uh, maybe for Councillor Miller. Uh, what is in this development for the local residents? So I think we've covered this off. So it will be a brand new state of the art new library. Um, it will be good, highly flexible new community space. It will be adult learning service provision. With that community space also comes new community services. And we want to engage in a process of co-design with local residents on that. We've talked about uh, a soft play area and a GP surgery as well. Uh, so not to mention a new cafe on that corner of the square, bringing new life to the green uh, in that location. So there's a huge number of new facilities for local residents, uh, which will be paid for through the enabling housing development. Um, I also think that the building, when we have the completed designs and people get to see that this will be a genuinely excellent building of the highest quality, they will think that that building is there for them as well. I think absolutely critically, there's a need for affordable housing, particularly affordable housing at social rent, so what we traditionally understand as council housing, and enabling people who are desperate to be able to live in Chingford and close to the Green to be able to do so. I think it's really important that our people, that our children, have the opportunity to get onto that housing ladder and do so in good town centre locations and this development will enable that. Thank you very much. OK, uh, I'm going to try something a bit different in terms of bringing people on stage. Ben Ben Terry, who's with us on the tech side. Ben, could you just bring on uh, Kieran Painter, please, who who has his hand up at the moment? Um, yeah, of course. Just one moment, please. Thank you. Um, and if people are putting questions into the, into the chat, then I will uh, I will fire those away as well. So, Kieran, I've just made you able to unmute yourself, so you should now be able to uh, unmute your uh, microphone. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, a couple of questions, really. Um, we're, we're talking about height, um, a reasonable amount in the conversation. It's a conservation area and the building is going to be four stories higher than what's currently there with housing adjoining two sides of the current site. How do you avoid that being an issue for those residents adjoining the site and close by the site? That's the first question. And the second question is, you said earlier that it's going to be a car free development. How is that policed? How, how do you stop people using cars that live in the flats? OK, why don't we take that in, in reverse order? Does um, somebody just want to pick up the car free development uh, aspect? How, how, how do you go about policing a, a car free development and how would you do it in the context of this particular uh, site? Um, who's looking like they want to answer that one? Potentially, Joe. Joe, you're on mute. Sorry, um, 
the so typically with car free developments the key way of enforcing them is that if they're in a controlled uh, parking zone the um, person who lives in the property isn't issued with a residence parking permit okay and then on on the high uh phil do you just want to briefly touch on on how six stories can be I, I think you did cover this a bit in the presentation but how is six stories justified in this location um well we it's just worth saying that we we have been given the brief which contains uh a, a limit let's say of up to six stories so our initial uh, appraisal is based on understanding what six stories means in in this context um um it's not for a, we will develop a design and it's for i suppose other people to appraise it uh, more uh, from different perspectives from our own perspective we we um are developing a design already which we think is is distributing elements of the building uh, and and the height and massing in in ways which are um uh, w which will not have such an impact on those uh, uh, adjoining neighbors and uh, views from the green etc and so it's the way that we organize the building and the massing in different ways it, it won't be a single lump if you like uh, it's the way that we distribute that that means that we can be uh, sensitive to the adjoining neighbors so and uh, and that's that's our task essentially you know there there is a within the brief a certain uh, square meterage of community provision uh, which the majority of that is a library and there, there is um, a circa 40 flats and that has its own square meterage and how we get those sensitively in our in our with our skill and in our opinion within the site is is what we're up to now um, okay phil okay yeah. thank, thank you i think that answers the question um and of course i, I there, there's lots of chat on this and again um council officers will pick picking that feedback up um ben could you bring on uh fear north again we tried fear earlier and it didn't quite work out so i'm hoping you'll be able to uh bring fear on for us yeah sure let me just try that So, Thea, you should now be able to unmute yourself. No, it doesn't look like it's going to work for Thea, sadly. Um, so, so we've got Mike Crimes, I think, is the next person uh, on the list, as I can see. So could we bring on Mike, please? Yeah, sure. Can you Mike, hear us, Mike? You be able to... Hear me? Hi, Mike, we can hear you. Please ask your question. Okay, uh, well, I, 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 you'll have to excuse me, I've got two, but what, one is really to echo what Yvonne said earlier about what facilities can be done in the combined space. If one believes in the concept of a 15-minute city, then this is the only public space mm -hmm. where dramatic public uh, productions and the like can be put on at the moment, and I appreciate what Simon Miller said about how the thing's not paying, but it would be a real loss of facility for people in Chingford if it went. And the, the other question I have really, well, that's more of a comment. The other question I've got really is relating to the library uh, and whether anything's been thought about making, mm -hmm. if you like, our local archival family history type facilities available in the space, uh, particularly given the uh, limitations of the existing vestry museum. Uh, so I'd be interested to know whether that's been looked at. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Great, great question. Um, I think we've got Aidan here from the uh, from the library's team. I don't know, Aidan, you might want to pick that question up. Um, are you there, Aidan? Yep, I am. Hi there. Hi, folks. Um, yeah, I think I think we're um, what what we'll be looking at doing is expanding the services that are, that are currently in the library there. So we'll have a lot more space um, to look at what we can do there. Um, if we look at the model that we used with Wood Street, um, we pulled together a community engagement board. So we had eight members of the community who helped us formulate what that library would look like. So if you look at um, the pictures of that library, if you walk into that library, um, that's been a labour of love of a group of very interested locals. And so that would be the model that we'd, we'd look at um, in progressing any sort of development of a library at that site. Thank you very much. OK, the next person we'll bring on is uh, Brian O'Leary. So, Ben, could you bring on Brian? Yep, sure. 
Brian, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Brian. OK, we'll go for we'll go for John Pines in that case. Yeah. Hey, John, you should be able to unmute yourself now. John. OK, uh, I think we'll go with uh, there's obviously a, 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 people are not quite getting the, finding the mute, uh, the unmute button here at the moment. But I'm going to bring in in that case, Jane Blake. So, Jane, I've just allowed you to unmute yourself. So ask your question. OK, I don't think uh, Jane has managed to find the unmute button either. Um, OK, uh, I've got Councillor uh, Mitchell Goldie here. I'm going to just allow you to unmute Councillor Goldie. So hopefully, are you there? Hear me? Yes, we can you hear, hear me. You. Yes. Right, my question really is, um, I think the, the most important question is Simon and uh, Paul. If at pre application the majority is opposed to this application, and oppose the redevelopment, as we're seeing, seeing the thousands of people signing petitions. Will you push ahead? Hey, Councillor Miller, do you want to do you want to yeah. take that one? Hi, Mitchell. Um, so I think what we've always said is this is a proposal. Um, we're going to see if we can bring forward a viable scheme. At the moment, this is hasn't been fully designed up yet, so people are responding to a hypothetical. We are going to bring forward the detail of that, exactly what it's going to look like, the detailed plans, then there will be a cabinet decision made as to whether we go ahead or not. And that will be based on viability, because the whole point of this is to use this one asset that we have in North Chingford on Station Road as a catalyst for regeneration for the wider town centre to create opportunity to create jobs for local people, to create supply chain opportunities for local business, to provide community services that currently aren't being provided, from a modern new setting to provide adult learning services, including employment support so people can access jobs, and to provide really, really good, flexible community space that can be used for the types of productions that Mike was talking about and Elaine was talking about before. And don't want to get people hung up on this. We are talking about at least 3.5 metres. That's what I said, not 3.5 metres. So it will be tall enough for those productions to be put on. And it means that it's affordable and sustainable and provide the affordable housing that we know are urgently needed. So that will be a decision that's made by Cabinet. That will be the decision uh, that is made by Cabinet in January as to whether we proceed or not. And then there will be a further stop-go point a bit later when all the final viability work is done. Thank you, uh, Councillor Miller. I'm going to bring in uh, Alice Lazel-Smith. Um, so, Alice, I'm gonna, I've allowed you to unmute, so if you find the mute button, oh. you should be... Oh, hello? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, yeah. Okay, perfect. I have many questions, but I think the ones I'd like to focus on, if that's okay, is you said that the final kind of the final scope and the design will be approved in January, potentially, and then we'll be able to have more input in the spring of 2021. Now, if the final scope and the design has already been approved, how much impact will the community be able to have to that? Uh, I'm going to flip that one to Joe, if uh, if possible, Joe. So the the final scope will be approved in January. We then move from the uh, concept design stage to the detailed design stage, and so there'll be further design development and community engagement throughout the spring. Okay, perfect. And if I could just ask one more question, one sorry. One more, yeah, yeah, one more. Um, no problem. Yeah, regarding kind of financial and if there's any case studies of previous libraries which have impacted their local areas, will those be made available and will kind of, sorry, I don't, don't know exactly how to phrase it, but will the impact, is there any already, is there already, you, uh, already yeah, any there evidence of the of... impact and examples and um, are those made available to us? So will those be made available? Um, Joe, you've got your hand up again, so uh, potentially yourself. That might have been accidental, but please. 
No, no so that is as part of the preparation for this presentation. The uh, Local Government Association, I came across a really good um, set of case studies on libraries, including uh, Wolf and Forest's Library Plus model, which is available on the LGA's website and has some really, really good um, examples of the way different local authorities have uh, taken forward their library offer. And I think, uh, Councillor Miller, you, your hand's up as well, so you might want to follow up. Yeah, ju just to say, I mean, I think we can host that study on the on the Hub webpage, so yep. it's available to people so they don't have to go and look for it. So if a team could arrange for that to be put up, uh, I think that can only be a benefit. Okay. okay. Great. Um, I'm, I'm just going to read this question out from uh, Jane Blake, who wasn't able to unmute when we tried to bring Jane on. Um, uh, she says, couldn't unmute, but how large will the individual uh, units be? Um, may well be a bit early to be asking uh, that question, I think, but um, potentially feel that might be something uh, you can comment on or Joe. I, I, can, I can pick OK, that. Joe, yeah, take that then. So, so a range of sizes so from one to three bedrooms and um it's early days but also to the uh, rear of the site facing mornington road there is the opportunity to put some townhouses there as well okay understood um phil unless you put your hand up i'm going to move on to the uh next uh question so uh, trevor i'm going to allow you to unmute now so you should be able to uh come on and ask your question can you hear us, Trevor? Potentially not by the looks of things. So uh, Stephen Jacobs in that case, I'm just going to allow you to unmute. So if you uh, um, find the unmute button, you should be able to ask your question. I'll give it a second. Potentially not. Um, OK, uh, I'm going to go for Tony Fawn in that case. Tony, I'm going to press the allow to unmute button. Uh, hopefully you can you can ask your question. Right. Um, thank you very much. Now, Councillor Miller has already had my um, extremely long letter on this, but uh, there have been another couple of points I've raised by today's meeting. Um, I'm a resident in Mornington Road. Mm -hmm. Now, we, it has already been mentioned parking in reality is difficult. Um, and we've heard this talk of a CPZ um, and as a resident, I was very anti CPZ um, because I don't believe it helps the community. OK, in reality, we're going to have a problem. Construction traffic is only going to have one access route into this site. So it's all going to be down Mornington Road, which means either Mount View Road or Buxton Road are going to become very heavily congested and vehicles are probably going to have to reverse down into this site, which creates more problems with health and safety, etc. Um, and an ongoing effect is going to be that these properties will need vehicle access for deliveries, whatever. Doesn't matter what people say about, you know, cars, etc. There will be the need for vehicles to be able to access the buildings to, to supply stuff, and this will all have to come from Mornington Road and this is going to increase the congestion in the area, which is t totally unsustainable at the moment. So what is going to be the thoughts about proper access to the site? Not during construction, but also when it's being used. Also, we keep getting mentioned about Wolf. Uh, T the, the Tony, come to, your, come, to your, come to your second question, just because yeah. I've got 14 other people yeah. waiting. So right. as concise as you can be, please. Yeah. Well, the question is, will we be given details about Walthamstow Assembly Hall costs and running costs? Is that being fully utilised? Um, anyway, thank you very Thanks. much. That's my Thanks, question. Tony. Thank you. Um, hands up who um, wants to take the issue around um, construction traffic. Um, and uh, the Assembly Hall. Councillor Miller, yours was first up, so please. Yeah, so I'll, I'll hand over to Joel in a second, but so construction traffic will be managed through what's called the construction logistic plan, which is agreed as part of the planning process. It's a really detailed document and that will set out flows. We will be a considerate constructor, that is a guarantee. Um, obviously, neighbouring residents will have concerns around that, there will be a process engagement to make sure that we communicate properly with residents about how that will be done. 
Um, I think it's far too early to, to talk about necessarily exactly where supply will be from. Joe may have a slightly different view because he's much more involved in the detail of this. Just on Walton Assembly Hall, it is being used as office space currently during the COVID crisis and whilst the town hall is rebuilt. Um, and it also, a bit like Chinkford, uh, Chinkford Assembly Hall, doesn't cover its costs as fully as it needs to. But there is a plan as part of the redevelopment of the town hall to ensure that it's placed on new footing so that it does cover its costs going forward. Thanks. And Joe, could you get just a, just a very concise follow up, just because I'm conscious of timing, please. Yeah, as, as Councillor Miller said, there'll need to be a full construction logistics plan. The um, council is taking forward a number of major projects on very tight sites. So, for example, um, Juniper's House by Wolf Association. So we have a really good track record and experience of working with our building contractors to um, minimise the impact of construction traffic as much as possible and as councillor miller said will engage residents it will be a considerate contractor site and, and and every effort will be made to make the impact of construction as little as possible on people going about their lives and surrounding streets okay thanks joe i did promise uh, alan in the chat that i would ask his question so i'm going to ask it uh, now so my question is about the cafe we've had a couple of questions on the cafe so keep this one concise i'm not convinced about the case uh, for it being made fair enough uh, it seems to be about talking about seducing people into the building also f okay so this we'll take this element also phil said that it would enable people to find the library in an informal way i have no idea what that means phil what do you mean by finding the library in an informal way um well i mean libraries obviously can function without cafes and, and other community buildings can do as well um but what we've found in lots of our buildings and through our own experience is that um, where people might not normally enter a library specifically because they think that's not a place that they would normally go to go and read a book or use the computer facilities or, or, or attend an event that's on, they might actually go in and use a cafe because they would like something to eat or drink. Or they're meeting friends there or they're on a play date so that the what I was trying to say is I suppose it's a it's an informal way to um, that people might use the building whether they use anything more of the building is 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 something that they uh, might discover themselves and it's maybe not necessary for them to do but it, it, it's a it's a an introduction to the building and they can find other things in there okay Phil that sounds that sounds like a, an answer in that case um Trevor Calver if you press the unmute button you should be able to ask your question Trevor, are you with us? Potentially not. How about Ray uh, Ray Gibbs? Ray Gibbs, if you press the unmute button, you should be able to uh, ask your ask your question. Apparently not. Um, Saffron. Okay, I'm going to allow you to unmute now. Saffron, are you with us? Try and find the uh, the unmute button if possible. OK, not Terry Tatham. Terry, you should be able to uh, to <coughs> ask your question. Yes, have I got through? Yeah, you're through, Terry. OK, uh, first, a few points to begin with. I don't feel very engaged in this meeting and I don't feel that most of the attendees have been. Uh, I don't know whether another one can be arranged with better technical connections. But uh, as for feedback, I don't think you've you've heard too much. Um, the points. A couple of other points. The assembly halls seem to have disappeared in the architect's layout uh, schematics of uh, his nice bubbles. The assembly hall, which at the moment is the dominant feature up there, seems to become one of the smaller areas to be used. That may just be because his bubbles are not to scale, but I suspect with everything else he's got in there that there's not going to be too much room. Also, three and a half metres as other um, contributors have said is a ludicrous height for an assembly hall that's supposed to be a, a, a large airy space. Working on that basis, your six metres, uh, sorry, your six floors will never be within 20 metres, I wouldn't have thought. Um, my biggest uh, infuriation about this whole development is the parking consideration. Everything seems to be uh, roughshod 
over. But we, we live in Chinkford. We like living in Chinkford. We like the way Chinkford is. And the Central Council seems to be telling us we need a hub. They're going to give us a hub. But unfortunately, that comes with a six story building with 40 houses above it. 40 houses, 40, uh, I mean, probably something like 20 to 40 extra cars. And Joe Garrett, who earlier was speaking about a CP, we won't give them a CPZ uh, permit, is the normal way. Well, that's, there's not a CPZ in that area anyway. So that, that was just a red herring. In fact, I'd like him to respond to that, why, he's, why he gave an answer that was just totally misleading. OK, Terry, um, just because just no, I've, uh, I've got another 11, 11 hands up, mate, so if you I, can, if I can come to I do know, but, uh, while you've got someone on, it's worth listening to them. <laughs> Fair um, I've got refer, <laughs> refurbishment of the existing, because my heart of hearts is I, I, if, if the cost of the uh, a new hub is 40 new dwellings up there, I'd rather go without. But the refurbishment of the existing... I think that needs to be published. Now, anyone computes that to be five and a half million. That is an indefensible, wouldn't stand up to any scrutiny. I talk as a chartered quantity surveyor, so I'm not ignorant to these things. But um, I don't know what, whoever, yeah, who, who put, the question would be then, who put that cost plan together? OK, Terry. All right. Well, we've had we've had your comment. So um, I thank you very much for your time. Um, does somebody want to come in on the cost plan, Joe, potentially um, in the first? I think on parking, there's been some discussion on that this evening. So cost plan, please, uh, Joe. Uh, uh, Norfolk Property Services Limited, who are the council's technical services joint venture partner. And it was produced by a chartered QS with 40 years of experience. OK. I think um, I think that that's your answer there for that, Terry. And in terms of uh, engagement events, I, I believe, and we'll come back to this slide that there there is a future engagement event coming up later on down the line. So, um, as I understand it, this won't be the only opportunity residents have to engage with uh, this process. And Councillor Miller is going to either confirm, well, he's going to confirm that I suspect. Well, I, while I'll confirm that, it's worth noting that the whole point about refurbishment is that we have to be brought up to modern legal standards around accessibility. That suddenly means full rebuilding of a business and a really significant costs involved. That's we're not when we talk about refurbishment, we're not talking about light licks of paint. We're talking about absolutely fundamental rebuilding. That's where you, you are, how you arrive at that cost. And that's in order that you meet legal standards and requirements. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Rosalind. So I'm just going to now allow you to unmute Rosalind. So you should uh, be able to unmute. OK, can you hear Hi. me? Yeah, we can hear you, Rosalind, please. That's good. I don't think people found the little box. Um, I'm with KDOS and have performed at the Assembly Hall many a time. Um, in the local plan, which is on the Cabinet Minutes of the 8th of October, policy number 36, promoting culture and creativity, says protecting and enhancing cultural venues, development involving the loss of arts, culture and entertainment facilities will be resisted. And at the church meeting, that we had last year um we were promised no cultural venues will be disturbed and you say there is no other community asset within the area have you heard of richmond road car park build build the houses on richmond road car park houses and flats meeting the height levels that are already there and then refurbish the assembly hall put a lift in like they have at lopping hall in Loughton which is more than 100 years older than the Assembly Hall, and put in whatever else needs to be done for a lot less than 5.3 million. Has that been considered? OK, Rosalind, thank you. I think you've been heard loud and clear on that one. So um, I I'll probably throw that one over very quickly to, to Councillor Miller before uh, bringing in. Um, I've got a question from Jane Blake that I'll bring in. So Councillor Miller. So this, this isn't... A so I'm completely aware of what's in the local plan, all of the policies in it. Uh, this is about re-providing far more usable cultural community space. Right? So taking an asset that is fundamentally unaffordable and is unusable for a whole host of reasons, as we've previously discussed, and providing something that can be used, but specifically also can be used for a whole variety of reasons, including the types of performances that Rosalind and others have told us very, very clearly 
they want to be able to put on. Thank you, Councillor Miller. And uh, I've had a comment from Jane Blake saying, why am I ignoring the central parking problem, which hasn't been addressed properly? I think um, we've had the question uh, a couple of times and I, I understand that people may not feel that that's been adequately addressed and I'm sure that the dialogue will be ongoing. But for the purposes of this meeting, we're trying to get through as much breadth of content as possible. So uh, I'm trying to balance up the need to, to get through the breadth whilst also making sure your concerns are picked up. So I'm sure that conversation will keep going way after this uh, event does. So uh, P, P Heathley, I'm going to try and bring you on. So allow, allowing you to unmute and then we're probably uh, going to, to wrap up. So um, can you hear us? Potentially uh, not. Um, so I'm going to go for Francis Fogelman. If you can find the box to unmute yourself. I will I'm find unmuted. Is that okay? Ah, there we go. We've yep. got you. Yes. yes um, I came into this meeting a bit late, so maybe some things were answered that I, I've missed. So I, I don't want to waste your time if, if it's already an answer. Forget it. Um, interested i'm in um one sentence in the letter that was sent through at the end the project has set a target of 50 percent affordable home um i try not to be cynical but the word target actually sends my sort of you know sends shivers down my spine we've heard so many things about targets um without going too much into the pandemic you know we've had the targets of testing and all sorts of things. um so when you say a target uh how realistic is that or you know it could be a target but then it's actually in effect much lower secondly what does affordable mean affordable homes um you know if you've got a certain amount of money all sorts of things are affordable um so that is a bit of a meaningless not meaningless but it's not a there's no concrete answer to that one at the moment um and then the prioritize for local people i did not grow up in chingford but i have lived here for uh, most of my um adult life and my children grew up here um, neither of them has been able to um, or one of them certainly hasn't been able to afford anything here so I really like a question of my an answer to the question of what does the target mean I mean you could set a target but in the end it's only okay Francis we, we, what is I the think and how, who who is local who understood who is local and that question hasn't been asked so we, we I will put that one to uh, to the project team so thank you very much for that so um, Councillor Miller I'll bring you in yeah, so thank you very much and thank you, Francis, for the question. Um, so the first part of it is it is a target, but it's a target that we may exceed. Uh, Waltham Forest has the best record of affordable housing delivery of any local authority in London, with 44% delivered over the past three years. That's across private and public land. Our policy is that when something is built on public land, as this would be, it has to be 50% affordable. We say it's a target because we may overshoot it. Uh, it may be done by habitable room, i.e. the number of affordable bedrooms in the total development. Uh, affordability is a legal definition. It is 80% of market, but I think this is where this becomes interesting. Our policy is that within the number of affordable housing, 60% of that has to be at social rent, which is the equivalent of council house rents. So we're talking 40, potentially 40 homes in total, 20 of which will be affordable. Of that 20, 60% or 12 will be at social rent and eight roughly will be at what's called intermediate rent, which is 80% of uh, uh, market value. Uh, thank you, Councillor Miller. I think we're going to draw um, proceedings to a, a conclusion this evening. So thank you ever, ever so much to everybody that's uh, attended. If you haven't been able to uh, ask your question, um, the best thing to do is email chingfordhub at walthamforest.gov.uk. Uh, you can also visit the website where the presentation uh, and video will be hosted, and that's walthamforest.gov.uk forward slash content forward slash regeneration dash chingford dash hub and uh, you'll you'll find the information uh, about these particular proposals um on here so um i'm going to draw proceedings to an end thank you very much for attending um and have a good rest of uh, your fireworks night evening thank you